Welcome back to Amerisogyny. I'm your host, Hannah Blue. You're listening to episode 25, Survival of the Mentally Fittest. That's right. I'm dedicating this episode to every person around the world who is ready to give up on themselves. They say only the strong survive, but that's not true. The resilient survive. The ones who refuse to give up, they are the survivors. A passage from the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Now, it's too bad America doesn't embrace diversity. It doesn't, and I'm not going to lie about it. But today, I want to talk to the poor, huddled masses around the world. My message today for you is not to give up on your life. Now, you may say, Hannah, you don't know me. You don't know my struggle. I have no food. I can't afford to feed my kids. And you're going to sit here and tell me, don't give up? You're going to tell me to know my worth? What does worth taste like, Hannah? Can you tell me? Or, Hannah, I'm dying. And I was just turned away from the hospital because I don't have insurance. Are you going to tell me not to give up? And that knowing my worth will save my life? Or... Hannah, I was raped last night. I'm hurting so bad, I can't even use the bathroom. I can't tell my parents because that will bring my family dishonor. I'll be killed. How exactly is worth going to help me? Some of you might be saying, I'm being bullied in school. I'm afraid to go back. Who are you to tell me not to give up? Or... Someone is touching my body in ways I don't like. I'm being sexually abused. What worth do I have? Oh, yeah. I've heard it all. Hannah, you don't know me. You live in the U.S., the land of opportunity. You have it so easy. Oh? (laughs) You think so? I'm glad you said that. If you stay a while and listen... I just may change your mind about that. Our first stop, the USA. I look at all of these immigrants risking their lives to get into this country. But don't think I want you, the listener, to be fooled for one second by the bring me your huddled masses rhetoric. Here's some truth. Black women have been dealing with America's bullshit for over 400 years. Not 500 years yet, but we're getting there. Our very existence is questioned and disregarded. Even our celibacy, you know. We're constantly depicted as insatiable whores. Everything is overlooked. Gaslighted. Our knowledge Expertise, education levels, titles, they mean nothing to many of the majority. When we share our history, it's viewed as complaining and it makes some of the majority very uncomfortable. And I don't give a damn. How are black women really viewed in America? Listen, let me take you through some stories. In 2016, a passenger became ill on a Delta flight shared with Dr. Tamika Cross, a black female physician. Her employer was Lyndon B. Johnson Hospital in Houston. What oath do doctors take? Do no harm. So when a flight attendant asked if there was a doctor on board, Dr. Cross raised her hand, ready to treat the passenger. Hmm... Her word wasn't good enough. 
a flight attendant demanded she show credentials to confirm she was, in fact, a real doctor. The flight attendant said, Oh no, sweetie, put your hand down. We're looking for actual physicians or nurses or some type of medical personnel. We don't have time to talk to you. Dr. Cross shared her experience on Facebook, stating, I'm sure many of my fellow young corporate America working women of color can all understand my frustration when I say I'm sick of being disrespected. Mm Mm-hmm. We sure do understand, Dr. Cross. Her story collected 14,000 comments by minority professionals who added threads to the fabric of her darkly woven experience. Inese Crawford posted, Tamika, I know exactly how you feel when people don't want your help because of the color of your skin. I go through this on a regular basis, and I'm just a pharmacy associate. They assume that I don't know what I'm doing or don't want to deal with me at all, but have to. Black doctors matter. We feel safer with people who look like us. If you've never heard of the Tuskegee Experiment, a.k.a. the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, it happened in 1932, and it was an experiment that studied black males who had syphilis. The study went on well after a treatment was found, but the subjects were never notified. Some of the men died, and by the time the whistle was blown, the damages were too catastrophic to repair. Biggest consequence was blatant, resounding mistrust between black people and non-black doctors. This is especially critical in matters of selecting OBGYNs. If you're going to get on a table and prop your legs open, you want someone who understands your culture. From candy yams and baked macaroni and cheese on Thanksgiving the way your aunties make it, to old stories of the South of sharecropping, and having to leave elementary school to go work in the fields full-time. A white guy on social media recently told me, color doesn't matter when it comes to disability. Hmm. It must really be wonderful to have such privilege and ignorance. When black patients express anxiety over symptoms and levels of pain, it's disregarded. This has happened to me right in Raleigh, North Carolina. I needed surgery. The female doctor I was referred to looked me right in my face and said, you don't want to have a surgery you don't need, do you? I was livid. I held it. I had to. What good would it have done for me to lash out at her? But I was firm. I let her know I lived in my body longer than she ever would. And I knew what I needed. I had been in excruciating pain for two years. Couldn't sleep at night. I knew what was best for me, and I advocated for me. She did the referral, and I had the surgery. Now, the surgeon I had was a woman of color. Wonderful. The nurses, of all colors, were amazing. Right here in Duke Hospital. But that's a very clear issue women of color have. We are referred less to specialists. It's 2023 and the experiences of black patients is clinicians of non-color are hostile, cold, condescending, dismissive, and impatient. How does that build trust? It doesn't. Many people of color would prefer doctors of color if they had access to them. But in the field of medicine, be it general practice or in mental health, we simply do not have enough people of color to assist us. The golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. To treat others the way you'd want to be treated. But sometimes, bias rears its ugly head, be it subtle or loud and clear. Are medical schools better? No. Racism has permeated America's institutions of higher learning as far back as our ancestors can remember. An OBGYN, last name Adams, 
shared his experience when he went to medical school in Atlanta, Georgia in the 80s. He says he was taught in medical school, if a black female patient presented with pain in her pelvis, it was assumed she had a sexually transmitted disease or PID, that's pelvic inflammatory disease, and it's usually caused by gonorrhea or chlamydia. The assumption was rooted in supremacy and stigma about black women's sexual activity, but not white women. According to Adams, if the same symptoms were presented by a Caucasian, a young white woman, then the assumption would not be an STD, but endometriosis. Endometriosis has no correlation to sex, is not stigmatized, and not tied to the patient's behavior. Racial bias is everywhere. And finance, too. In 2022, a black female doctor sued Chase Bank for racial discrimination after she tried to cash her paycheck and was denied. The check was for $16,000. Dr. Malika Mitchell-Stewart tried to open an account and was told by the bank employees her check was fraudulent and, as with Dr. Cross, they demanded she provide an abundance of information to prove she was a doctor. Chase has apologized and said they would conduct an investigation of the incident. But let me tell you, I don't know if the case has been solved, but I hope she gets her money. And in the good old South, back to North Carolina again, a zoning commissioner refused to call a black female doctor, you guessed it, doctor. On April 20th, 2021, Dr. Carrie Rosario, who has a doctorate in public health and is a professor at UNC Greensboro, was in a virtual meeting with a zoning commissioner named Tony Collins. Collins just couldn't wrap his head around the fact that Dr. Rosario was a doctor. And he showed it by refusing to address her title. Collins addressed her as Miss Rosario, to which she said, it's Dr. Rosario. Thank you. Now that brought me back to one of my first jobs in North Carolina, where we had a black female doctor and they actually called her Miss instead of doctor. So yeah, that happens. Collins called her Miss Rosario again and was corrected again. And he said, well, you know, I'm sorry. Your name said on here, Carrie Rosario. Hey, Carrie. How condescending and disrespectful. Dr. Rosario said, I wouldn't call you Tony. So please, sir, call me as I would like to be called. That's how I identify. And Collins responded, it doesn't really matter. My God, women of color around the world. How many condescending conversations have you had with men that weren't of color, that were of color? Can't count, huh? Hmm. Well, Dr. Rosario continued and said, it matters to me and out of respect, I would like you to call me by the name that I am asking you to call me by. I'm verbalizing my name is Dr. Carrie Rosario. And it really speaks very negatively of you as a commissioner to be disrespectful. Oh, but the disrespect didn't die down. Colin said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but you're negotiating something that happened four years ago. Well, a unanimous vote by the city council removed Collins from his position over his indifference. During the meeting, Councilwoman Sharon Hightower, a black woman, said Collins displayed white privilege. She said, this is ultimate disrespect of black people by one that's white and feels entitled and privileged to say and behave whatever with no consequences. This is what we deal with as African Americans. I get this regularly from other folk, so I know how it feels. Dr. Rosario stated, I introduced myself as Dr. Carrie Rosario intentionally because as a black woman, 
I am often dismissed in a lot of different spaces. Some of that is because I am young looking. It hurt that I'm in this public forum trying to do right by my neighborhood and advocate for our needs and our voices and hearing him feeling disrespected and just belittled in front of the viewers of this live broadcast. Dr. Collins said she holds no ill will against him and it's a moment we can all learn from. As for Collins, he said his comments were out of line and there is no good excuse for my interaction with Dr. Rosario, so I will not try to offer one. Citizens deserve better. My opinion, the damage had already been done. And if you're a woman of color, you know exactly what Dr. Rosario was talking about. What do we do when this ugly ignorance rears its head? What can we do except to move forward? We have no other choice. What does help? Creating spaces for ourselves where our knowledge and contributions aren't dismissed or replaced by mediocrity. It is crucial to optimum functioning of our mental health. This podcast is my space. I don't have to see or hear anyone's issues, privilege, judgment, and so on. They may write whatever script they like with themselves as the lead superheroes and cast me in whatever villainous role they please. I don't have to read it. My personality was shaped by my environment. I had to learn hard lessons very early on. As a result, I am not what one would call a soft lady. I kiss no one's ass, ever. It is very difficult to earn my attention and trust and it takes seconds to lose. If you know struggle, then I know you. No matter where you are in the world, no matter what country you live in, we all have experiences that connect us, bind us, traumatize us, leave us wandering together in the wilderness of our minds. And for some of us, trauma makes us resilient and intolerant to disrespect. Some of us just exercise our intolerance more than others. I've never met you, but I've met your struggle. I've met rape and molestation. I've been introduced to hunger. One of my cousins bought groceries for me when I was pregnant. I've never forgotten that. To this day, I'll buy groceries for people and pay for their meals. To this day, I've been introduced to abuse. I know what it means when dark is not perceived as beautiful. There is no country I can travel to where dark skin is number one over white skin. Now that's due to colonization on a global scale. I know what it's like to be thin and to have meat on my bones and be absolutely sickened by the stench of fat phobia that permeates the world. I know what it's like to have relationships with sociopaths when I didn't know my worth. Now this generation's trash men have the audacity to ask women, what do you bring to the table? We bring every motherfucking thing. That's what we bring. So yeah, I know you. I also know you have an interest in mental health. And some of you listening to me dance with mental illness. Some of you struggle to wake up daily, no matter who you are, what you look like, what color you are, what religion you have, or not. Some of you question why you're even alive. Otherwise, why would you be listening to a woman on a podcast about mental health? I do no deep breathing here. I may not have a physical illness, but I can tell you I've struggled with suicide my entire adult life. And who better to kill me than me? What saved my life? My love for my daughter. And knowing what I'm worth to her. Now, if I can come into this enlightenment, if I can wake up one more day to tell you to wake up one more day, then we know each other. And that makes us friends. I was recently in a space where I recognized I felt the way Dr. Collins, Dr. Stewart, and Dr. Rosario felt. Now, I'm not a doctor, far from, 
But I have awards. I made the dean's list many, many times. I have knowledge and experience in mental health and autism due to my daughter and black history as well. And I felt, ooh, ooh, I'm recognizing some shady vibes. I'm sitting on social media watching brothers and sisters talk about race and history and current events and black voices, and they got no buzz. But when it was a non-person of color saying things about black people to get brownie points and likes and kudos, even if it was something a person of color had spoken about consistently, it got rave reviews. As if it was never said, how twisted and perverted is that? And when I spoke up, was I gaslighted? As sure as fine as Bruce Hung has beautiful dimples. And I handled it. Now, I, and you listening, can allow these experiences to make us bitter or make us better. I'll always choose better. So I removed myself with no hard feelings. But I simply decided my worth is bigger than this space. And that's what I'm telling you. There are spaces in your life where people want you to be confined They'll gaslight you. They'll get offended if you don't like their treatment of you. That's their problem. So don't own it. For as many ignorant people of non-color there are in the world, there's some beautiful people too. They'll seek to understand you. They'll listen to you. And believe it or not, you'll help them in ways you can't even imagine. No matter who you are, if what I'm saying hits home, Roll out the welcome mat for my words. There are people in this world who will try to place you in a box, a category. They'll give you a lower status simply because of how you look, the color of your skin, your weight, your identity, or gender. I need you to look at yourself and see whether or not you fit into what is acceptable in your country. If you fit the mold, you can leave. And have a nice weekend. But if you don't fit in to beauty standards or masculinity or sexuality, if you're an underdog in any way, stay a while and listen. I will provide examples of underdogs and how they fought to come out on top. Every time you think about giving up, be inspired by these people who just like you all around the world may not have had money or love or acceptance. They may have had hard lives, just like you, but they made it. I had a dream that I visited a soup kitchen with my grandmother. She passed away many years ago. And there was this little boy, a beautiful boy with dark skin. And he was described to me as a mute And I was told in the dream he was from Senegal and was relocated to Zimbabwe. Now, he was described to me as a mute, but the boy talked to me. He was a small boy, but he had a deep voice. He said, I've had a hard life. And I said, why, baby? He said, I had to go it all alone. And I told him I understood. Oh, man, there's a God. I'm telling you, somewhere in the world, that little boy exists, and he talked to me. Now, you don't have to be from Senegal to feel unseen and unheard, but know that you are seen, you are felt, and someone cares. And that's not a cliche. I'm not selling bullshit. This podcast is free, and I don't have one ad on here. I talk to people, in person, and on this podcast. That's my gift. Connection compassion. All of the BS we've dealt with in our lives has brought us right here. Me talking and you listening. Are you ready for our next stop? Here we go. The motherland, Africa, Abidjan, Ivory Coast. Vivian Kwame says in her teens, the pods on cocoa trees reminded her of babies clutching their mother's backs. This aspiring entrepreneur decided cocoa would be in her future. 
So, in 2021, she created her business, Chakove. Kwame says, I want to be the face of Ivorian chocolate. She's an inspiration because she's a female in a male-dominated field. Although Ivory Coast is the world's top producer of cocoa beans, they're exported, then processed in other regions. As a consequence, Ivorians receive less benefit from the industry. Chikovi is a small chocolate business consisting of Kwame and five employees. They process two tons of cocoa annually and sell it in malls. At the time the story was written, she was looking for investors to grow the business. Her love of her country is evident by the beautiful, intricate packaging she uses. Some of the chocolate bars are shaped like a map of Ivory Coast. Others are wrapped in beautiful, colorful displays of the country and its rich traditions. Vivian, we wish you all the best. Cheers to being the queen of chocolate in Ivory Coast. Our final stop, back to the USA. Now there's a book that caught my eye. It's called Drama Queen. One Autistic Woman and a Life of Unhelpful Labels. A memoir by Sarah Gibbs. Sarah is autistic, but she wasn't diagnosed until she was an adult. The book is very detailed, and she shares her truth of what it was like to live as an undiagnosed person with autism. Before I get into her story, it resonated with me on so many levels. Enter Sarah Gibbs. She says she struggled with socializing. She was ostracized and called weird and a crybaby. She described herself as clingy, loud, and loquacious. When she experienced sensory overload, she'd cry, scream, and hit her head. Her parents called this Sarah's little tantrums. She says, although her parents waited for her to grow out of the behavior, they're going to wait forever. Remember I talked about creating your own space? Before she was diagnosed, Sarah didn't. In her words, she spent her entire life working overtime to act like everybody else. She tried to assimilate and look normal. Whether the setting was educational, professional, or personal, she viewed each opportunity as a chance to fit in. She said duplicity worked for a while until she was discovered and consistent pressure and anxiety was exhausting and added to her trauma. As a consequence, she was suicidal and contemplated if she'd ever have a place in the world. Things got better when she met her husband. She says he was the first to understand her, to care for her without judgment or complaint, and handled the reins of things she struggled with, such as housework and shopping, which overwhelm her. She was 30 when a family member who had a son with autism suggested they thought she may be autistic. The family member explained misogynistic preconceptions can be a barrier to being diagnosed. Misogynistic preconceptions. What's the name of our show? A misogyny. You see, every episode I bring to you is connected. Diagnosing girls and women who may be autistic is often overlooked due to how we socialize. I love the example Sarah used. Being fixated on a boy band, like BTS, may not be perceived as unusual and is written off as hysteria. She mentioned being lucky to have her husband's health insurance. She waited a month for an appointment with a clinical psychologist who confirmed she was never lazy spoiled, rude, dramatic, or any of the self-loathing labels she says are stuck to her with metaphorical superglue. According to the clinical psychologist, it was a miracle Sarah survived for so long and carved out a place for herself in a society that wasn't built for her. Sarah says her diagnosis has transformed her entire life and the way she sees herself. Here's the beauty of this. Sarah's story ties into everything I said today. Not fitting in with society, the importance of creating your own space, surviving, it all ties together. 
I shared these stories to say, too often humans believe they are so different. No one knows what they're going through or how they feel. Pain is pain, no matter who you are, especially in matters of mental health. When we create spaces for ourselves, we unknowingly create them for others too. Sometimes our spaces are shared with people who need them far more than we do. We exist to better the lives of others. Your pain, what you're going through right now, will heal someone else. Now, that may not feel good to hear right now, but I promise you, whatever you're dealing with in life, there's a way out. And it's not death, it's life. And I'm out of time. If you got anything out of this message, please follow me on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or wherever you listen from. Thank you for being a part of episode 25. I never thought I'd make it. I bet you didn't either. But you did. And I'm glad. Be easy. Take care of yourselves. Have a good weekend. And as always...